Okay. Okay, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, November 17th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Fast, if you could please call the role of board members to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Mrs. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Ms. Jose. Ms. Stoleski. Present. Ms. Hassan. Present. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Fass, could you please call and note the names of any additional staff members participating in today's meeting? Dr. Yarborough. Present. Mr. Handy. Present. Mr. McCall. Present. Ms. Lagerman. Present. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I would just want to check, are there any other board members who have joined us that we did not call? Okay, and are there any um, staff members who have joined us that um, we didn't call? No, nope, hearing none, okay, well, move on. Um, what we're going to do is go ahead and start with our first item and our first item of business is system improvement team quarter one review recruiting and retaining a highly qualified and diverse workforce. And for that we have Mr. Douglas Handy and Mr. McCall and Ms. Lagerman. Thank you. All right, thank you Ms. Scott. So um, again, I'm on to lay us our presentation. Again, just here as liaison to introduce our fellow staff members who are here to present on um, our topic for this evening. Um, so I will turn it over to them at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doug, and thank you, board members. And of course, to Dr. Yarbrough, thank you as well. Um, my name is Homer McCall, the uh, Director of Staffing. And so we wanna thank each of you for the opportunity to provide updates for our staffing and recruitment system improvement team. What we'll do is we'll go through each one of our uh, strategies 1A through 1C uh, and then 2A through 2Cs and Heather would take over at the uh, for the uh, the second um, st second strategy 2A through 2C. As for the 1A, I will be providing an update as to where we are currently. And what you'll find is a recurring theme here with our alliteration of the P's here, proud process and the problem. So uh, I don't like to think of things as problem, but it fits for the uh, for this in this case here for the scenario with uh, problem. But still are those challenges that we, we face uh, with trying to uh, move through this work, this very important work. Um, of course, for the, the proud process and problems, starting with the proud for strategy 1A, which, which entails define quality measures of success and build successful monitoring tools for tracking effectiveness of recruitment sources and methods. So some of the things we're proud of is we're proud to report that we've met the teacher diversity workforce goal, which was originally planned in the COMPASS so we'll be adjusting these goals using the current 22-23 school year as the baseline for this data. We'll adjust according to the 22-23 MSDE state staffing report, which will be available uh, in late uh, November. We're also proud to report that the HBCU uh, recruitment plan has been revised. Each year over the next four years, we're looking to increase the number of diversity events and uh, fairs at HBCUs at which we plan to attend. We're also proud to report that the Administrator Alumni Report has been completed 
And this report gives us a list of all of our administrators, school base and central office, and where they attended undergrad and graduate schools. And as we review the recruitment schedule for this current school year, we're remind, we'll be mindful of uh, including our administrators who are alumni of these various institutions so that when we go out and actually do the uh, um, the fairs or the events, um, they have an opportunity, the students will have an opportunity to speak with the administrators, and that gives them a, an opportunity to see themselves in our administrators, showing them uh, the opportunity, not just as teachers, but also a uh, career for uh, advancement here in VCPS. We're also proud uh, to report that we've developed and posted our recruitment schedule online. Uh, many of the institutions, oh, thank you, I'm sorry about that, we're in the head. Many of the uh, institutions in which we uh, have listed utilizes Handshake, uh, which is our online recruitment platform, which gives us an opportunity to be even more proactive with our recruitment, um, particularly at our HBCUs. We're also proud to report that we've uh, received feedback from our principals at each of the levels, meaning elementary, middle, and high schools. Um, these principals were selected from all three zones. And among the most noteworthy of uh, the themes that arose from these conversations, is that we need to staff our buildings earlier. And so we've heard, and now we're in the process of drafting a more aggressive timeline to staff um, with our priority transfers, with our voluntary transfers, so that we can then move on our new hires a lot sooner. So you have to keep in mind that some of these new hires are not only applying to BCPS, but they're also applying to other school systems as well. So as we transition now to the process under 1A, BCPS along with other LEAs is working on uh, the BCPS hiring practices and diversity report, which is due to MSD on July 1st of 2023. And much of the work that we're doing in our system improvement team for recruitment and staffing will be helping us with completing this particular report. We're in the process of gathering recruitment data from our um, various recruitment events and some of the data which we're looking to, uh, that we'll be collecting and reviewing so that we can actually identify the success of the event is how many individuals actually came by the BCBS table, and visited us, uh, how many were actually interviewed and successfully made into the pool. And then in addition to that, at a different level, is how many of those who did interview made into the pool actually received an advanced contract. And as we are in the process of building our relationships and partnerships with HBCUs, we're also organizing classroom visits uh, for our education and non-education majors. This allows us to actually cast our net much wider to, uh, to a much wider audience so that we can actually attract those who are not just education majors, but also in their areas such as math or science or even in English. So, this leads us now to what are the challenges, if you will, under 1A. So everyone on this call know there's a national teacher shortage. And given the national decline in the number of teacher candidates, we have to become even more intentional in our recruitment efforts. And so we, just, of course, have that in our recruitment plan and also in our HBCU recruitment plan. We have to also be mindful that as teachers are looking they know that they're holding out, we know that they're holding out for that specific offer, that specific school. What is it that attracts them? So we have to make and be mindful of uh, where teachers are in the driver's seat and, and it currently is an employee market. Next slide, please. This brings us to strategy 1B update for teacher intern recruitment. Some of the things that we're proud of under 1B, under teacher intern recruitment, is that we are excited to have two dedicated retired principals. We're working with our certificated staff and to focus specifically on recruitment and selection of student intern efforts. Our two retired principals have successfully hosted three in-person intern fairs in October with more than 75 interns who were attending. 
In addition to that, uh, supports are available for schools to assist with screening current interns prior to the completion of the experience. We can't wait until after they've completed their internship because even when they're with us, they're still looking. So we will make sure we try to interview them while they're working with us and hopefully be able to make that connection um, sooner than rather than later. We're in the process then also with ongoing application and candidate pool review is occurring at this time. Uh, this process allows for more accurate pools and provides opportunity for our candidates to be connected with schools for interviews. We also have uh, in the process of receiving feedback from the intern fair. It's been reviewed to adjust for plans. As you know, as I mentioned, we have the, had it in the fall. We also plan to replicate these efforts in the spring. Once again, a uh, problem, but then at the same time, we like to look at it as a challenge. We continue to focus efforts on improving our processes and offerings to ensure that our student interns return to BCPS as teachers. And then also to ensure timely and smooth processes are working with, we're working with colleges and university partners to set timelines for future projects that allow selected student interns to earn intern experience while being paid to, uh, to long-term sub. Next slide, please. Now, under Strategy 1C updates for expand professional development schools, especially partnerships with HBCUs, which provide college internships and with a focus on high need schools. Once again, the, pro the process and the challenges or problem here. At this time, we have made connections with the schools yeah. of education for Bowie State University, Coppin State University and Morgan State. Discussions have occurred to define criteria for identifying professional development or partner schools. And Rossville Elementary has formally established a partnership with Morgan State University. Under processes, all three institutions have determined to start a partnership with identifying students entering their field placement experiences in the spring of 2023. Plan is to build a pipeline of teachers starting from the field placement experiences through the final year long year long internship. Building these partnerships will include training of site coordinators, which could lead to teacher leadership opportunities for advancement on the career ladder. Then under uh, potential problems or challenges, if you will, one new pathway uh, to teaching and creating teacher pipelines is teacher apprenticeships. HBC partners are interested in this potential approach to train retain and diversify the BCPS teacher workforce. Further planning is needed to properly prepare both teacher mentors and interns for the on the job experiences. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to the presentation over to Heather Lagerman uh, for the strategy 2A through 2C. Thank you. Thank you so much, Homer. And part of what we're uh, very proud of, as, as you let know our alliterative theme here, is the collaboration and how this is truly a cross-divisional, cross-department, cross-school partnership uh, in the staffing and recruitment system-wide improvement team to really look at how can we all come together uh, to do what collectively needs to be done to recruit, retain, and support our um, teachers and leaders. So in the strategy two areas, you'll see strategy 2A is all about analyzing exit survey data and really looking at how do we collaboratively design a coaching program that includes all of these different uh, support providers, PAR consulting teachers, department chairs, staff development teachers, peer advisors, all of the folks who are coming together for coaching and support to look at how can we better address teacher identified needs. 
And in this group, uh, which you can see is co-led co by uh, Joelle Bielski and Mary Dagan, we always want to give full credit, um, is the first thing that they're proud of is the focus group uh, initiatives that they've been working on and that they are almost complete. The process is set, the forms are ready, um, and the process is going to be that if we cannot um, come, we're looking at addressing the stipend concern, which is in the last column. And if we are unable to obtain stipends in a timely fashion, we will be um, having response to questions electronically so we can make sure um, that regardless we will be able to get this important information and really think about how do we find out uh, exactly uh, the why, uh, why people are staying or leaving um, and their concerns and being able to do that in a focus group that's really going to um, help them feel able to have that trust and vulnerability to share what they're thinking and what's driving their decisions. Uh, the other item that's on there is the data cycle. We're very excited that the team has developed a data, data, data cycle and is coming together across departments to really look at analyzing all of that data and problem solving collaboratively. And so um, we are currently working on, we just have some um, survey results from NEO that came in this week. Um, and so we're looking at partnering with offices to develop next steps on that and um, identifying some areas there in the problem that we're working on, some areas, some opportunities uh, for collaboration around expediting the onboarding process and how we can volunteer as central office staff to help with that and to ensure that support is really timely um, and looking at the database of new hires. So those are the two uh, main initiatives there with strategy 2A. And then if we go to the next slide, for 2B, um, the focus of 2B is engaging building administrators in providing targeted support for new teachers. So thinking about what do our principals and assistant principals uh, need to keep in mind, such as regular check-ins, scheduling new teachers to have fewer preparations, um, as is a, a strategy that's research-based, and dedicated classroom space um, instead of having them need to move across multiple classrooms, all of those things that have been identified to help uh, provide a supportive, conducive environment for our new teachers. And really just the whole theme of this is to think about how can we be very intentional in supporting them every step of the way and having our new teachers really feel that support and that we are looking long term at supporting them and wanting to hear their needs and be responsive. Um, so when you look in the first column there, um, one of the things that uh, this team has been working on is looking at the mid-year hire process and really looking at making that smooth and efficient for new hires um, and looking at that collaboration. You notice that's our theme, uh, really looking at every, every part of our organization here in the uh, BCPS system that contributes to this so that we can all come together around expedited procedures and collaboration to make sure that everyone is hired and processed in a timely fashion. And also communication, that is the other piece, is making sure that we communicate uh, that, that clear support, that effort to make sure that we are always checking in and making sure that they feel part of our BCPS family, both the system and the, the school in particular, so that they have both levels. And that's why the administrator focus in this section is so important, um, so that they're seeing it both in their immediate surroundings, but also feeling a part of the family of BCPS. And so, um, one of the things that we're looking at there is just how do we look at, again, expediting and making sure that we can bring everyone together around um, all of the different components that need to happen and making sure that principals are integral in this design process uh, because their voice is so important as they're hearing um, most of the feedback right there in their own schools and can definitely contribute to that. And that's why we were very excited. Um, when uh, Dr. Nishay Bennett uh, started with this work group, as you can see, she's one of the uh, co-leads and then um, was promoted to be uh, an executive director of schools. So we had her both principal perspective and now her executive director perspective as well, which is very helpful to have both lenses. And then for strategy 2C, the next slide. Uh, that one, you can see the focus is coordinating the design of all of those new teacher support programs across the systems to make sure that help feels like help, that all of the roles and responsibilities within support programs are clear, and to use the data to drive the decision making um, and the design of the support efforts to make sure we have very responsive programming. And so one of the things we're extremely proud of is the new educator support portal, which has a Schoology code there. 
um, and we're working with determining where to put that on the website so that it will be quick and easy to access um, so that we can make sure that everyone can get all of those resources uh, quickly and easily and that they're accessible to all. And then um, we've always got our acronyms, so I'll, sh I'll share the abbreviations, the staff development teacher and professional learning liaison meetings. Very excited that there's been a team approach to supporting new teachers and collaborative PD that's facilitated by PAR, teacher leadership and teacher development. That's back to what we're saying about how do we bring all of our departments and offices together around showing that we're all talking, we're all collaborating, and we're all keeping them in the center of our decision making and design efforts. So for that one on one new teacher support, um, we're very excited that 68% of our new teachers have been matched with the CT, uh, the peer advisor or the staff development teacher or other support provider. And then also just looking at there is located in the portal that new teacher school based support roles and system wide opportunities document that really helps capture all of those things for them in one spot. And we're also um, uh, the breaking news. The upcoming work is the supporting non tenured teachers after school workshop series for department chairs, which we're hoping will be another facet of support that will be helpful. And uh, we've been very fortunate through Maryland Leeds funding to be able to expand the peer advisor program. So that's another layer where we also love that that um, brings about an opportunity for existing educators to support uh, our new our new educators and be compensated for doing that. So um, we've got those. And then the last part is targeted coaching, professional development and support for schools with high number of non tenured teachers is another component with uh, Maryland leads where we're able to in partnership with new teacher center offer some customized professional development that's research based and is providing them with additional tools for the toolbox at the school level um, for the support providers and for the administrators of those buildings and those have gone very well so far. So. That brings us to the end of our overview of all that has been happening in the staffing and recruitment system wide improvement team. Great, thank you. Mr. Handy, I didn't know if you had any anything additional. That was um, the completion. Uh, yes, Ms. Scott, essentially it was. And just a, a reminder, we did have uh, a presentation on staffing and recruiting in the spring um, at the end of our former uh, previous school year and I know the committee did talk about getting an update so I want to you know thank fellow staff for bringing this first quarter update so just wanted to connect that um, you know uh, mention that through line in our previous presentation of what we had here this this evening so. okay great all right well yeah thank you for that um, I can start off with questions and board members if you have questions please just put your name in the chat um, so I wanted to know it was stated earlier that you worked with uh, I guess HBCU job fairs or recruitment um, sites. So I wanted to know of those job fairs, how many did you go to and approximately how many resumes were submitted for people wanting to come and teach at BCPS or, or any kind of job? I can report from last year it was around 14 or 15 actual HBCUs. Now, in terms of the data, when it comes to numbers of resumes, I don't have that right off hand. OK, so the 14 or 15 represents. The what? HBCU and diversity events, yes. The, OK, so last year, last 2021. Year, correct, 21, uh, 22. 21, 22. Okay, so yeah. from 2021, 22, you went to roughly 14 to 15 HBCUs. That's HBCU slash diversity events. Well, uh, most yeah, of HBCU which were, diversity events. Right. Most of them, uh, most of them were HBCUs, meaning like Morgan, Coppin, Howard, uh, Alabama a &M University, um, and of course, uh, we hadn't been to uh, Lincoln in a while because they've actually. Uh, uh, They've actually dis dismantled their program, their bachelor's program. So, but for the most part, they've been mostly regional. But then, if, now that some the schools are actually opening up their uh, their in-person events, most of which last year were virtual. Uh, so, but I don't have the data when it comes to the number of resumes that we have uh, we uh, received from those events, though. Does that data exist? The number of resumes? Yeah, just how I. And I could be wrong, but I assumed when you go, you 
uh, somebody adds up, you know, was it worth it? Uh, did we collect a lot of resumes? Was there a lot of interest? Um, I guess that's sort of what I'm looking for something or, or a way to quantify um, a benefit from being there. I'll be glad to, to look into that to see if we can get the number for you. I don't have that number for you right now. OK, all right. Yeah, I, I think it would be good to know um, what those um, events yielded. Absolutely. Especially if we were at 14 to 15. Um, because I mean, that builds up on my other questions. How many resumes did we receive? Um, and then, you know, how many of those actually turned into interviews and where mm -hmm. were those interviews? Were they system wide? Were they specific requests? Did they mostly request to go to one area or um, do you have that information? I can see if I could pull that for you. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. And then I guess then the logical one is then out of that, then, you know, how many offers were made, how many contracts? Uh, were offered. Um, I guess I'm looking for some information, some data, because just to to go is is great. But absolutely, what are we getting from it? What is it yielding us, and how is it ultimately helping with our our overall plan? It all leads back up to Dr. Williams' <laughs> plan. Absolutely. So. No, that that is important um, because we want to make sure that when we are going, that it is a very uh, a useful uh, event that we've we've uh, yielded the results from it. I will say that in the this past year, coming out of the pandemic, uh, a lot of uh, institutions haven't quite opened up to the in person just yet. Uh, they are slowly transitioning back into that, so we are looking to go and be in person in a lot of the events. Uh, this year, but uh, as we, as I mentioned before, in the HBC recruitment plan, we are using this year as our baseline, the 22-23 school year as the baseline. But I will certainly see what we could do to help get those that information to you, though. That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. It looks like there is a question from Ms. Stileski. Thank you. Um, what a wonderful, really concrete plan that. Um, you know, you've created to um, address this long term. Um, my one question regarding um, the new teachers, it sounds like you're doing quite a lot to support them with the portal, with making sure that they're paired up with a staff member. Um, and of course, um, the pressures that the new teachers face in terms of figuring out classroom management, figuring out lessons, so um, can you just describe a little more specifically the the role of the mentor or whatever staff member um, they're paired up with, how that actually can help support them, but just without adding extra stress and workload to their daily um, teaching? Thank you. Sure, and and um, all of those different roles that we mentioned, you know, are, are differentiated depending upon the person. But basically, that the goal of the whether it's a staff development teacher, a peer advisor, a consulting teacher, there's varying levels um, of support that are provided. But they are given the content so that they can develop the relationship and then identify what is helpful so that it's not as though it's one size fits all. But they're customizing based on, like you're saying, if there's a classroom management issue, they have resources they can provide. They can do modeling. They can go into classrooms and provide that. They can provide that type of support where they're also perhaps perhaps uh, co-teaching at that point or doing something so that they can learn together and feel that support and then debrief uh, and have those conversations. So it really does depend on um, the sure. needs. And so it's customized and that's the beauty of, of the models is that there's uh, we've got the, the content from New Teacher Center as well as that's what we're very excited about, gives additional tools for exactly what you're saying is uh, okay. some different models that are going to feel definitely as supportive as possible and not something that that anyone is forced into or feeling monitored, but rather um, supported and offered different um, different things that can help meet their needs and build their toolkit. Right, of course, because we all you know certainly can agree we want the teachers to remain in the school system and just continue teaching. So yeah. thank you for that. Sure, and that's part of the reason why that collaboration is so important because sometimes help doesn't feel like help if there's too much help, right? Like you're saying, right. if it's overwhelming. So that's why all of us coordinating to make sure they're not getting too many uh, outreaches. <laughs> right. Is one of the things we do, but thank you. Thank you so much. It was a very, very complete description of what your long-term plan is. 
Thank you. Yes, looks like there's a question from Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you for the presentation. Um, one of your processes that you said during recruitment is to include principles in the design process to ensure the gaps are addressed. So ultimately, the staffing for teacher, teacher recruitment for each school lies with the principal. Could you elaborate on how you're helping principals to address those gaps? I'm sorry, could you repeat your question, Ms. Oh, Jones? In your presentation, you okay. said you were including okay, let's go find principles out. in the mm -hmm. design uh, process to ensure that the Can gaps were being addressed. Out. Can you elaborate on that process? So when I mentioned about the principles, will we take principles with us on recruitment uh, 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 events or fairs? Many of them are speaking through their lens of when they were an alum, well, actually when they went to that institution, maybe oh. as an undergrad or as a graduate student. Um, so I, when I speak, when I speak from my part of the presentation in terms of their their usefulness in terms of helping us with uh, recruitment, they're actually talking with that student, showing that basically through their lens says, I was a student just like you, and of course. I've been in BCPS probably maybe 15, maybe 20 years. Started off as a teacher, but now as an administrator, whether or not it is central office or whether or not it is school-based, they're able to show them that opportunity not only exists but only in the classroom, but outside the classroom. So they have those opportunities for career advancement. So that's the piece that I was speaking uh, in reference to principals assisting us with, uh, with the recruitment uh, events and fairs. I don't think I don't know if, if that answers your question or not. Uh, not fully. So I still mm -hmm. want to understand the process of after you recruit, how are the principals then um, getting those diverse recruitment into their schools? Is that something central office dictates or does each prin principal so, dictate who they get into their schools? So as a part of that process, so that takes it to another level. Once that person has submitted an application online, then of course uh, that person is, uh, whether or not they did an interview at that particular job fair, or if they're invited for an actual interview online, or they come in for an interview, we, uh, they're then placed into an applicant pool. So once that person's in the pool, then any principal in the system has access to that particular individual. We have a uh, set up to where every principal within the system can a has access to whether or not it's if they need an English candidate, they can go into the English pool and call that individual or send an email to the individual and ask them for um, if they would like to come in for a school based interview at that time. So we're not directing necessarily them to those schools. All principals have access to all of the candidates in that in that pool. Now, if we do meet now someone on the trail, we may say, OK, well, this would be a great candidate for school X or school Y, or what have you. And of course, with in mind, keeping in mind the diversity of that setting and trying to, of course, keep in mind how we can help with diversifying not only just the school system, but also each individual school. So um, but there is th that level at which when we're out interviewing and they meet them at those events, the person submits their application, they're successfully placed into that pool. Any principal in any school can have access to those applications, or so not applicant, but the resumes themselves. So is Does there any scenario? Um, no, still, you okay. explained it, but is there any scenario where an applicant does not get picked by anybody? When and applicant, what happened to their applicant then? Um, well, it, it would, I don't know if you're, you're alluding to a specific individual, but we have, um, I, I want to say that based upon when a person is in the pool, every, you can almost guarantee you that 10 to 15 principals are given the call to that inv individual. Given, a, especially, I don't know if you heard part of the presentation where we talk, as you know, there's a national teacher shortage. 
So mm -hmm. given that, given the uh, number of applicants who make it into the pool, I don't know of any particular specific case where somebody is not at least given that opportunity to come in and interview and even probably even made an offer just given the the uh, state in which we're in currently. OK, thank you. And um, sure. can you do you know what happens with the exit surveys? Who conducts them? And is anybody compiling that data? With exit surveys, I would have to get that information from my uh, executive director. Thank you. Any and other? have you taken any steps? I know we're working with local HBCUs. Have we taken any steps to expand it nationwide to reach out to other HBCUs? Absolutely. That's um, as I mentioned to you, not only just locally, but Coppin, Morgan or Howard, Bowie State. Uh, we've gone to um, to Alabama A&M, to Alabama State, um, to other parts of the country, Tennessee State University. Uh, other parts of the country. As a matter of fact, last week, um, Claflin University in South Carolina had a virtual event. I conducted that one myself. Uh, with that in mind, we had a, um, uh, even if an individual is a freshman or a sophomore, <laughs> uh, I still will interview them uh, just to sort of plant that seed about BCPS. So we've not just uh, included just the uh, local or regional, those within the state, we have gone nationally. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you have any other questions, Ms. Jost? Was that it? I'll hold it for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And it looks like there is a question from Dr. Hager. Um, yes, thank you. And I apologize for uh, coming late to the meeting. Um, so I missed part of the presentation. Um, and so I have two questions, uh, and if they were answered again, <laughs> just let me and then I can listen to the first part of the recording. Um, so the first question is a topic I've about in the past, and that has to do with the fact that um, I, I think our recruitment efforts are wonderful, but I imagine they're similar to our other part, our neighboring school systems. And so um, without, you know, saying, what, what you found if you've done this, are we at least tracking the success of the efforts of our other partnering school systems to see if, if others are um, kind of be um, to get at the candidates that we want and, and, and kind of to understand why a candidate may choose a neighboring school system over us? Because, that, you know, we all know that a lot of the reasons that people choose the position is, is, you know, proximity to their home. And if they live equidistant from two different school systems, they may choose another for, for other reasons. Thank you for that question. As a matter of fact, um, there is there may be a number of reasons why a person may choose a certain school system over another or a certain particular school over another. Um, when it comes to school systems, it could be, like you say before, what is the commute like? What is then also, they may be looking, especially a first year graduate, maybe looking at salary uh, as that that key thing, that factor that, that attracts them to the uh, school system. But we have to keep in mind though, recruitment is not just in human resources. It is a system-wide effort. It only not only includes, and that's why we've made that effort Nick, to include our school-based administrators to assist with our recruitment into the uh, into BCPS. And so when the principals or school-based administrator is out with the system, it is part of their duty as well to help recruiting those individuals into the, uh, the school. Now, as I mentioned before, those individuals who are in the pool, when the, every principal has access to those individuals, now it's then up to that principal then to sell, that, sell their school to that person. And um, that's why I say it is definitely a, an effort on all of our parts to, uh, to recruit individuals to the school system. But there are a number of reasons why uh, the uh, individuals are choosing one school or, uh, over another or school system. Um, but we can't pinpoint that one thing. And that, of course, but a lot of those, like you said before, is because this school is in their community. They want to stay close to home. Um, they could be the salary, but those, those are a few things that come to mind uh, currently. Yeah, and, and just I, I ask it because if there is, a, you know, a modifiable thing that we can do as a school board, 
um, to you know promote uh, teachers choosing us, you know, that, then that that would be something that that we can, you know, we would be able to consider if that is indeed being tracked um, when we do these recruitment events. Um, and so my second question, which again you may have addressed, has to do with um, encouraging our current high school students to consider a career in education and, and then uh, teaching it in, in Baltimore County Schools. And I know that we've had some efforts in place over the years to, to do that. Has there been any modification to those efforts? Is, is this something that you all are exploring as well? Some of those efforts are through our College and Career Readiness. I think you may be referring to as the uh, TAM or the Teacher Academy of Maryland. So we've expanded that um, that effort as well into several of our schools. A lot of that work is, like I say, it's collective. It's not just human resources, but in CNI. So uh, we have been partnering with uh, CNI with those uh, those efforts to help with recruiting individuals who are currently in high school, uh, showing them the pathway to becoming uh, teachers. We also include the, uh, the opportunities to, to uh, for our seniors who are going through TAM who are committed to becoming education majors and then later on coming back to us as a teacher. And we provide a $4,000 scholarship per year for those up to $4,000 per year for those individuals who are looking, we call it the teacher scholarship loan program. Uh, the scholarship is obviously the money that's uh, given to them to uh, to help with their education. The loan part comes in, it's not they're paying it back, but they're paying back with their time to, uh, to come in and uh, work with BCPS. Yeah, I just again, we're, we're such a diverse school system um, that it seems like a, a, a really great opportunity to um, within, you know, and encourage our, our students to pursue this career path. So that's all. Thank you very much for the presentation. Yes, absolutely. No problem. Our goal is, though, of course, I would like to just share this is that we know it, it is a, uh, a system wide effort. And it's uh, and one of the biggest things, of course, is, you know, as people who are currently educators and have children themselves going through the uh, through uh, matriculating through BCPS is encouraging them to to look at education as a career. Um, but sometimes people may decide otherwise, say, you know, uh, may not encourage a child to do that. But at the same time, that is one of the things that we say it's a, a system-wide effort for everyone else who is not only just administrators but teachers as well. Okay, thank you. Looks like we have a mm -hmm. question from Ms. Hassan. Thank you and thank you all for this outstanding presentation, acknowledging all of the great things that are happening, the things that you guys are doing and putting the work in and as well as some drawbacks that we that I know that you guys are working actively to do your best and, and mitigate around and solve. So thank you guys for that. Um, I did have a question about obviously, you know, diverse hiring is one of those things like I've had the opportunity to see that in person um, through my own experience as a student member. So that's really awesome. Um, I know a lot of students have shared with me um, and me personally, I did not have a teacher who was a person of color up until my sophomore year in high school. Um, and that's definite that definitely speaks to the schools that I went to. I went to um, middle school and elementary school. A lot of my schools were predominantly white institutions. Um, they were predominantly white elementary and middle schools. And I think that there is a lack of diversity, especially there. I'm very fortunate to go to a school that is incredibly diverse now. And I'm very grateful to have staff that represent me and that look like me and have an increased amount of this app. So I see I see what you guys are doing and it's it's definitely well received on this side. Um, but on the topic of of schools that are majority white, how can we ensure that that those schools are just as diversely staffed with new recruits and new hires just as much as you know, my my current high school is um, I know there, you know, as much as you know, those schools may not see the benefit of having a diverse staff. I know that the minorities in those schools do. I know how important it is to have those diverse staff and how much I wish that I would have had a more diverse middle school staff, for example, or a more diverse high school staff. I know just recently at Hereford Middle School, they just got their first um Muslim teacher and to me like I like I like my my middle school principal told me that and I was like that's perfect I wish I had that when I was younger so how can we ensure that this is something that 
is continuously happening at every single school and, and, and seeing that impact for our students of color so that they feel comfortable coming back to BCPS and, you know, extending that same favor. And I'm so glad that a lot of amazing teachers of color commit to our county. Mr. Hassan, that was a very good question. And thank you for that question. Um, when Let me just give you a little history about myself, if you don't mind. This is 2022, school year 22-23. And it's unfortunate that there are some schools in the school system that do not have a teacher of color on their staff. We've come a long way. I will share that. We have come a long way. And by sharing this, just a little bit about myself. When I was, uh, when I had children who were in the elementary school, I'm not going to name which school it was, but I was saddened by back to school night when the teachers on the stage, and this was early 2000s, okay? About to date myself though, but <laughs> it's 2005, 2006. And the principal introduced the entire staff and there was not one person on that stage that looked like me at all. But when you look at the crowd in the audience, it was certainly not reflective of the parents who had their children in that school. And to take it just a little bit further, the one person that this principal introduced who was the person of color was holding a mop on the side of the stage and said, this is our building service worker. Just wanna introduce you to this person. My heart sank because you're saying that, and this is not to minimize the role of which that person played in that building, but my heart sank by seeing that and by saying that no one of color could be on this stage to teach my children who are going to this school. I wasn't a part of the school system at that time, but I was fortunate enough to later come on board here from another school system, but living in the county. And from that day forward, I said to myself, something's got to change. And by doing that and where I am now, yes, if we don't interrupt those, those instances and challenge people to say, hey, you need to look at the individuals who are in your building. There's something to say about people who you're teaching, but then also those who are teaching those students. So you need to be cognizant of not only just your student population, but also be, make it more reflective of the, uh, make your staff more reflective of your, your student population. So as I said before, from that day forward, once I came on board here a few years later, I said, of course, there's got to be a change. So fortunately, I will say there are some, uh, there, there are some schools that make good, that make strides, as you mentioned yourself but there's still some schools that have not taken that leap. So as a part of that, yes, we do everything we can to try to, uh, to increase the diversity in our pool, but then also increase those opportunities for those who are not selecting candidates or may not have somebody on their staff of color uh, to consider all applicants. We don't know what, who they are when they apply. I have to admit that because that is part of the, uh, we don't know their, uh, their ethnicity, we don't know the race, we don't know their gender once they apply. But once they come on board, that's when they have to disclose all that information, right? So with that in mind, what we have to do is just be mindful of all those factors as we are, as we are recruiting to consider, hey, have you taken a look at you know, student uh, at this particular candidate. Some are making, like I say, making those those efforts to diversify their staff. And it's just a matter of of having everyone see that through those same through that same lens. Um, it, it, it hasn't been easy work and it's not going to, you know, it, it, but it has, as I said before, 
we've made strides, but we want to make sure we're continuing in that same vein. Now, once we've gotten that person, now it, it, I will say this, once that person's there in the building, say we got one person who they said, oh yeah, well, I, I, I've, I've interviewed, I've got a teacher of color here on staff now, but what are we doing now to support them? It's one thing to get a per, have a person on color on staff, but what are you doing to support them? And a lot of times they may feel as though they're isolated or a person on an island. And if that's the case, what are we doing to retain them? It's that's another part of that whole picture that we have that we in HR, that we our partners or the Heather's team we're looking at. Because if you get them there, what are we doing to help retain them and provide those supports that they need when they're on staff? So uh, I thank you for that question. It was a very good question, um, especially through, through a student's lens. It, it's one that I think of, especially having my own children go through. Uh, uh, through the school system. In a lot of cases, in a similar situation where, uh, like yourself. So thank you for that. Hope I answered your question. Yes, and thank you very much for that, Mr. McCall. That was um, very, very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Didn't want to cut you off. Did you have another question, Roa, or, or were you finished? I'm I'm perfectly good. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that. It made me feel very seen. And it's it's good to know that there are people on the other side working to make it better for the next generation of students that come after me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's not easy work though, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ms. Stileski. Thank you. And yes, thank you for sharing your personal story, awareness and sensitivity are sort of the first step and it sounds like a plan for going forward will make things better for all. Um, I just had one quick question. I really like the idea of the um, up to $4,000 scholarship for the seniors to um, commit to teaching in uh, Baltimore County. Um, I had never heard of that before. How is that promoted and is there a plan perhaps to increase the awareness of that possibility because that really does sound like a great opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. That is actually through our work with as uh, through our officer certification. Uh, so I can get more information if you like for that and be able to share that with you. Um, but it, it um, in terms of how it's promoted and also I think it is a, a max in terms of like the numbers because obviously it's not a uh, a huge pot of money, but at the same time, it helps. Uh, but I, I want to say, I believe it's up to five scholarships though per year. So, but I'd be happy to get more information for you on that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I just had one follow-up question um, to some of the things that you said. Um, as far as um, diversity, um, like Ms. Hassan had said, the importance of students, young people seeing themselves reflected throughout the building, um, in the front office, in the classroom, um, every, everywhere, just young people seeing themselves reflected in um, in many different ways. And that I, I just, I pulled up the equity report that was recently presented to the board in October that was done. And some of the numbers in there, it was showing that um, American Indian, Black, African American students, Hispanic, and Latino counted for 54.4% of the county students. Um, according to this data came from the um, Maryland State Department of Education. It says, meanwhile, more than 80% of teachers and 77% of principals in the county school system are white. So that sounds like what you're saying. This is it reflected in numbers, which is why I like data um, mm -hmm. so that you can actually see what that data manifests into. And so I wanted to know, given that bit of information do you is um 80 excuse me it's 80 percent i don't know if i said 88 it's an eight zero eighty percent um is that higher than the national average for i guess a population of teachers at, at at any school i didn't know if you all knew that information offhand i don't have that on hand uh scott and um unfortunately but um 
we all I don't say we all know, uh, but I think uh, Ms. Song can actually uh, attest to this, and and I actually could myself, even, but I even though at the different generation, uh, most teachers uh, who are even in our school system and most other school system nationally are white women. Uh, that's one of the conversations that we even had in our uh, system improvement team. And uh, what do we do to, to interrupt that and in, uh, in, in create a change? But I would I would dare to say that it's probably not too far off from the national uh, percentages. OK, yes, and I recognize that that's why I was saying um, 80% is Baltimore County in line with the mm -hmm. national average or is that higher or lower? So um, if we could get that information, I, I think that would that would be great. And also um, if there's I Miss Jose had spoken about um, an exit mm -hmm. survey, I thought that you all had talked about um, an exit survey. Um, I didn't know if you would have something to share with us about that maybe at a later date um you know maybe giving the board a response on how the exit surveys are conducted i think that would that would be useful and um as well as things that you all are doing to disrupt those behaviors because miss joe's had asked that as far as who does the hiring at the schools it's oh, okay. I, I guess i'm just doing the math if yeah. it's you know 80 percent white female or, or white and it's 77% principals and that's who's doing the hiring then um, and that's continued for a period of time. Mm -hmm. How long I guess is the timeline to work on that to change that or to disrupt um, uh, those sort of numbers? Do right. you have anything to add on that? So when it comes to that and I, I thank you for that. Uh, when it comes to that, our um, in our recruitment plan, uh, was as mentioned in the in the presentation, in our recruitment plan, we're looking at over the next four years. We met the mark for what was initially in our in the compass, but moving forward for using 22, 23 as our baseline, we're waiting for the MSD state staffing report, which will come out later this month to use those numbers as our baseline. As we're increasing the number of HBCU or diversity events, the goal is for as we increase those numbers, we'll see a change or shift in those percentages from um, from BC, well, from our uh, teachers of color, whether or not they're African-American, uh, white, we should see a shift in those in those numbers as we move over the next uh, four years, but using this current school year, 22-23, as our baseline. Okay. So I'll be happy to uh, to share that with you too. But the Thank extra you. surveys, I've already gotten that marked down as a, um, as a point at which you would like information about. Great. Mm -hmm. Mr. Handy? Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. I um, want to uh, really just thank everyone for the the conversation. Um, I'm very passionate about this topic. I am a member of this system improvement team. So um, again, I'm, I'm reflecting back to Ms. Hassan's comments and then on to Mr. McCall's comments, um, and even back to Dr. Hager's comments about the diversity of our student body and how that can translate into diverse hiring for teachers. I also don't want us, we talk a lot about the representation of teachers of color for students of color. I also don't want us to lose um, sight of the opportunity to have teachers of color in front of white students. And the data actually shows that teachers of color are actually beneficial for students of color and for white students. There are academic benefits that show that. And I'm just thinking the power, if you think about how our society tends to be segregated and we don't control that aspect, I mean, individually, we could choose to live where we choose to live. Think about though our school system and how we have the opportunity to put teachers of color in front of white students and help them to see a person of color maybe in a way that they hadn't seen a person of color before because they simply did not have that lived experience of interacting with a person of color in that manner and counteracting what media portrayals of persons of color um, typically are or sometimes um, you know overrepresentation in, in the negative sense so i'm just thinking about um 
you know, as we press on for that, how important it is. And also wanted to just circle back to Mr. McCall's comment again about, and I've heard from administrators saying, we, you know, we've we've offered positions as a teacher of color, they just won't come here. And I think it's time to sit and interrogate that as to why that is. And, you know, Ms. McCall talked about the supports that are necessary for a teacher of color to feel welcome in a school where they may be the only teacher. And what does that say about, you know, the environment? So there's so many layers to this. Um, and Ms. Scott talked about the, the quantitative data um, or data in general, and I, I heard, you know, the request for those um, exit interviews, which give us that qualitative piece as well. So I just really appreciate the rich discussion. I think this is, um, and I'm, I thank you for the committee to, you know, to to stay engaged in this topic. I think this is something that um, I actually can't get enough of, not talking about necessarily, but I see the movement of the the sit, which is very encouraging as well. So um, I, I feel like we're we're at a a good place to make strides during a challenging time for staffing of schools, but I think we need to be intentional, and that's been brought up this afternoon too. Be intentional about uh, the teachers we hire, and you know the diversity in those hires, um, and what it means for for really all of our students. And you know, keep that equity lens on our students of color. And I'm sorry, I'll say one last thing. When we talk about recruiting from our current students, um, being in spaces where we talk about recruitment for Black male teachers in particular. I think this is why it's so important to make sure that we are supporting all of our students, true. And then when we see disproportionality in academic achievement for black males, for disproportionality in suspension rates, you know, how can we really expect black males in large numbers to come back into an environment that has impacted them in a way that's that's negative? So I, I think when we look at that recruitment pipeline that Dr. Hager talked about starting, you know, in our schools. To me, it all ties together. So, you know, this is a very um, complex, um, I guess, situation, but I feel like it's one that we certainly have control over, very much have influence um, in as, as members of BCPS and, of course, you all as board members. So, thank you. I just felt compelled to speak my truth. Thank you for that, Mr. Handy. Yes. Thank you. I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to. Um, to uh, speak and share their truth. And um, was there um, any other questions or, or any other comments that anyone would like to share? Okay, thank you all. I mean, this was a, a great presentation and I think it sparked a very important conversation. Um, and um, I look forward to, to where it'll go. So next we have uh, the last item on the agenda is announcements. And the next equity committee will be held on Thursday, January 19th, 2023 at 4 p.m. The next equity committee, um, the next equity committee meeting with the Equity Council will be held on Thursday, January 5th, 2023 at 5 30 p.m. And Mr. Handy, um, would you mind just saying a few words about the council, like what the council is? Sure, briefly. sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Scott. Right, so just briefly, um, the, the council was actually um, created by the committee or requested by the committee to really be, when we talk about the multiple perspectives that are necessary um, to make sure that voices are heard across our school system. Once this equity committee was established, you know, with an eye on informing the full board around matters of equity, um, the committee saw the need to include a wider range of voices and perspectives that could be had with, you know, just that group of committee members. So that's when they asked for the advisory um, with internal and external stakeholders. And that advisory um, has been developing. The first year was last school year, and they've been developing um, to, you know, push for matters of um, budget and policy um, that pertain to equity. So that's it in short, but I do encourage, um, you know, stakeholders to keep an eye on the activity in that advisory. Um, and if, if folks are interested in joining, there's opportunities for that as well. Great, thank you. All right, and who and the advisory council is comprised of? Uh, you said it before, stakeholders and um, people who um, are working towards equitable solutions for young people. Well, for students. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Is there any further business? No. Nope. Okay. So hearing none. The meeting is adjourned and I thank everybody for joining us and being a part of the equity committee. So I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you.